Welcome to episode 12 of the Red Man Group Patriarchs Edition. We've got a solid panel today. We're going to talk about life lessons, what it is fathers are facing, how they're going to be passing these things on to our children in this new day and age. And we're going to focus on the fact that, you know, as, as fathers and as men who are raising the next generation, the only way to make the future great or to make the future better than how we found it is for us to play an active role in it. So we've got, a, like I said, an excellent lineup. It's going to be a solid discussion. Welcome. Smash the like button. You know, let, let's do this. So today we have the Socrates. We've got Ryan Mickler and Bobby Dino. So with each of these men, what I really like about this panel is they're already doing the thing that we're talking about. You know, when it comes to Ryan, he's talking about the, he comes from the order of man.com. You know, that's about brotherhood. That's about, you know, he has his kid working. He's passing on life lessons. And it's amazing to see. Then you have Bobby Dino. Bobby's working on a nonprofit. Bobby's working on getting his family involved and growing what it is he's doing. And then Socrates has manning up smart. You know, my red hat. Again, passing on a legacy, creating something that's going to last longer than themselves. All of them are creating these things. And today we've got them on the panel. So we're going to start out with Bobby and Sock. Sock, how you doing, man? What's going on? Doing, doing well. Great to be here and actually meet Ryan. So it's uh, kind of kind of one of those things where you know a personality on the internet and actually be able to see him, you know, relatively live on his screen. It's like uh, going to be great to see and hear what he has to say and uh, get to know him. Now let's talk my red hat real quick. How's it doing? Yeah. You know, that's awesome that it's out there and doing its thing. Yeah, it's kind of cr kind of crazy. The the notion of my red hat is not so much the story of my red hat or the fact that it's a children's storybook, but it was a question that we always kind of pondered uh, with my involvement in a twenty one convention of men bootstrapping themselves and trying to self improve themselves and take responsibility and agency of their own lives. And in recently, you hosted the uh, the patriarch event uh, where we talk about responsible fatherhoods. But you know, the interesting thing becomes is you know what happens if you you know we are talking to the wrong audience. You know, the people that are already damaged. What if you could go back in time and get to these people before they are ever damaged? Now, in reality, we can't do that. But what we can do is start today and talk to the children and help give the children skills, life skills for today, the, the, you know, kind of the classic elements of how to behave, socialization, all those sort of things that we need to do and learn but to do it in the le uh, a lens that we understand and value. And the key on this is you get there before the trauma occurs. So you don't have to repair a broken individual. Uh, and the, and the, the question becomes is how do you do that? And of course, you know, our, 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 viewpoint is you do this through uh, cultivation and particularly that's always from the father. Uh, and so what ends up happening is how do you teach men who have been grossly underfathered through divorce and isolation, how to father who don't, who have never had that imprinting themselves, you know? And so in essence, you're, you're giving somebody not only a manual on how to do something, but you're showing them how to do it while they're actually doing it live. And we figured, Hey, what would that look like? And we kind of basically came up with it at the last 21 convention in October. Uh, at the house party I threw and everyone's battering ideas about and it ended up being a very late conversation that picked up the following day uh the next two days in the convention and we ended up creating a product in six months actually let me pull it actually here it is I don't know if you guys can see this perfect product uh, placement yeah, I like yeah, so, sorry about that but <laughs> the, yeah a Anthony actually had a copy of it uh and so you know you'd sit down and say hey it's it's something that's out there we'll we'll give it a whack if we can get the support we'll continue on the idea is going to be a series of these but uh, we we just sat down and said we have to do something we're not going to feel good about ourselves if we don't if it fails it fails but uh, we're, we're putting it out there dude i wish you the greatest of success i think thank you thank you awesome bobby give us a quick yes, up sir. how you doing man i'm doing well how are you doing I'm doing all right <laughs> i'm in the shed I, I, I shed life baby I know I can see the construction going on. It's looking great, coming together. Awesome. So what's new? How's the uh, the, the business end? Everything working on your end, wheeling and dealing. I think you were talking that you were on a phone call and trying to manage somebody else on the while, wow. like right before doing this. Well, you know, um, other other entrepreneurs or, or people that are running their own businesses, they know it, it doesn't stop. It's like you wake up and you're instantly doing it, and you go to sleep, you know, doing it. So, I, or at least for me. So yeah, it, it is like that, but, but thank God that, I mean, I do have some business to do. Uh, I'm, I'm appreciative and, and, and thankful for that. Um, the writing is still chugging along. I'm doing revisions uh, for the nonprofit for what I need to, uh, to um, deliver to the IRS. The IRS can kick things back if they don't like the way it's worded or if they don't like it at all. And then you just have to start the whole process over again. So I'm trying to get everything right the first time. Uh, and I've, I've had some people look at it that are 
you know, really qualified people and, and just getting that moving forward. Um, and, and of course the speaking, I, I got, I just uh, finally got my passport uh, going to be in Poland and, and just looking forward to uh, reaching out to more men and helping more men. You had to, you had to twist that knife, right? So I will not be at Poland. <laughs> oh, that is the exact that. weekend that we're having the fraternity meetup. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to be missed. You, you know what? You and your ass for the rest of the show. <laughs> All right, Ryan, you probably have made the largest dent on the, the interwebs, but this is your first time in the Redman group. So for the men who follow here that may not know who you are, could you give us an introduction and how it is you got to where you are? Yeah, you bet. I don't know about the, the largest dent. I mean, we've, I, I think we've been fortunate. I think we quite honestly, I don't know, I, I don't want to say lucky, but stumbled into the right the right message at the right time. I think this is something men need. So I'm, I'm honored, first of all, that you guys would invite me to be part of this. This is pretty cool. Um, I love to see men lifting each other up. It's something society needs more than ever. And so to be just a small part of it is, is humbling to me. So I want to thank you guys for that. Uh, but yeah, I started Order of Man uh, about four years ago. Really, ultimately, when I started, I had no idea what it would grow into. Uh, my goal was to talk with men that I aspired to be like, guys who were successful in their businesses, guys who I thought had their family lives figured out, good fathers. Um, they had things locked down with their, their significant other, their wife. Um, yeah, that's, that's really how I started. I started a podcast, uh, with financial planning, uh, about seven, oh, let's see, six years ago and realized, man, I really love the medium of podcasting, but wanted to shift away from my financial planning practice. So I launched a uh, order of man with a podcast in March of 2015. And I mean, it just blew up from day one. So uh, we've been fortunate to reach millions and millions of men across the planet. And uh, again, it's a testament to what we're doing here, what all you guys are doing. Uh, I'm honored to be part of this. Uh, and and I, I, think, I think this is the right message at the right time. So uh, we're in a good place and we're doing good things. And it's cool to be around other men who are doing good things, which has always been my goal to put myself in the environment of other men who have achieved great things and things that I want to achieve for myself. So that's why this fraternity and organization is so important. So one of the guys in the chat was saying that they're going to the they're going to be watching the Democratic debates tonight. And and I couldn't help but think of the contrast of how they're they're going to work to break each other down and we work to build each other up. It, it's like selflessly giving. You know, nobody knows. I, I don't think I've shared it publicly, but I went to Ryan for help. I was like, hey, man, I'm going through some changes. You know, what, what do you think about this? You know, would you offer me that? You know, what, any advice? And like. Took, picked up the phone. We had a conversation and just, just giving like selflessly, Hey, here's what I did here. This worked for me. I tried that. That didn't work. You know, see, try this, see if it works out for you. And I did. It worked out great inside FOE. And it's amazing that when you look at any other group, it's, it's not that way. People are not looking to build one another up. They're looking to break each other down. And when you look at the patriarchs, what Redman group's trying to do, it's like the rising tide. All of us win when, when we all succeed, you know, your success helps me, mine helps them and they help them. It's wild. So let's just keep riding that wave, you know, let's keep doing it. Yeah, man, I think we live in this world of, of scarcity. You know, everybody thinks it's a zero sum game that if I get somebody else can't have, and I haven't found that to be the chase about anything. <laughs> so uh, I, I think it's better to lift each other up and support each other and help each other. And we learn and grow in the process. So it's a good thing. Hey, while you guys are talking, I'm noticing I'm a little dark here. I'm going to go flip the light on here real quick while you guys keep talking. I'll be right back to get that light. Right. All right. So while he's getting up to get some illumination, I'd like to let you two know we're about to hop into the, uh, the topic of the day. But before we do that, for everybody watching, our sponsor is Tactical Soap. You know, what we're doing, they're always helping us. They put themselves in the line. I actually put some uh, uh, God of War beard oil in before doing this, so I look sexy for all of you. So support the sponsors if that's something that you need in your life or you want to support somebody besides Walmart or Target. You know, help, help the men that are, are helping men. Ryan's back, so we're going to shift into the topic of the day. So the title is The Patriarch's Life Lessons to Save the Future. What are the life lessons each of us will be giving, should be giving, other fathers should be giving? So you look at something I was talking to the guys. We're in a different age. And Ryan kind of alluded to this with technology the way it is, with society the way it is. You know, people look back on the, 50, the 20s, the 50s, the good old days. That's when men were men and families were families and life lessons were passed along. And I think with our generation... You know, I'm 32 and I think, you know, plus minus 10 years, that window, we've got a whole different ball game we've got to work with. There's a whole new world we're facing. So I want to throw it on the table that what are the life lessons you're ensuring that you're instilling in your children? And what do you think are the new life lessons we need to start paying attention to 
whether it comes to social media use, what proper age to be exposed to these things. You know, do you, do you learn to master the analog world before you're dropped in the digital one? You know, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. And for all the fathers in here, towards the end, we're gonna do a quick Q&A. So if you wanna log your questions, you know, don't ask them now because it's gonna interrupt the flow, but you know, write it down or save it. And then, like I said, the last 15, 20 minutes, maybe we'll do a Q&A for the fathers out there who are trying to figure themselves out. So with that, I'm gonna throw the ball to you guys. Uh, you know, I might, I might start and, and, uh, and, and share something if I can. Uh, um, one of my thoughts is that in a, in a lot of ways, what we're facing is new. Uh, because we do have a lot of technology and digital technology and all this stuff as well. But in, in a way, we also are returning to something that I actually really enjoy and that I find a lot of value in, fulfillment in, is the ability to be at home with my family. You know, I think if you look at uh, prior to the Industrial Revolution, men were out tilling the ground and, and working with their boys and learning side by side, hand in hand through backbreaking work. And although, you know, maybe we don't have to do this backbreaking work anymore. Uh, it's pretty It's pretty cool that I'm able to work out of my house. It's pretty cool that I can get my son engaged in the business in the shipping department, which is where he's starting. Uh, this is this is a powerful opportunity, this technology that we have. I think so many people tend to like beat it up and look down upon how technology has changed us for the worse. And certainly there's been elements of that. But I've actually found the exact opposite to be true. This has opened up something that I don't think was possible 20 or 30 years ago when men had to go out into the workforce, leave little Timmy and little Bobby at home to be raised by mom and to be raised by the women in the school system. And now we have these opportunities through technology and social media to stay back where we belong in the household and be able to raise our kids side by side with our spouses. Uh, it's actually been really, really powerful and again, fulfilling for me to be able to do this. Bobby, you want to jump on that? Yeah, so one of the advantages that I had, I mean, I, I kind of uh, instruct guys to look for the silver lining effect. A silver lining is is when you can take a small victory from a larger loss, right? And so I I, I tell guys, hey, if if you do take an L, look for the silver lining. You know, look where you can learn. Look what look what was gained. Look what where you could improve. And one of the things, even though never having met my my father because he died before I was born. Uh, the, the silver lining there was being able to be kind of co-raised by my grandfathers, uh, spending time with each. And, and, and they had a lot of those old principles that, yeah, just aren't around anymore. So when we talk about what am I ensuring that's being passed on, it's the stuff that I don't see. And, and it's, it, it's stuff that is so basic to where I don't even think twice about it, but I'm seeing that I have to tell young men, you know, like, hey, hold open a door. Hey, if you're out on a date, maybe pull back a chair. Hey, you know, do something. I mean, just real basic type type stuff to where it was like manners where I ha I learned a little bit more roughly, you know, I mean, uh, them being as old as they were, they were also a little bit more hands on if you catch my drift, you know, so I, I was told something once, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but but uh, but but uh, these these kids, it's because and, and that's kind of segues into the, the second half of what uh, Hunter was talking about, and he actually did touch on it. Is this social media stuff? Um, I think I think the danger of social media isn't too much information per se, because we're going to have like right now are the smartest kids that have ever been on the planet. You know, uh, with, with with this information on their hands, um, I think what happens is is they can see a million different ways that they can be. So, and what I mean by that is my, my daughter used to watch these different uh, YouTube guys, you know, and, and, and at first I thought it was harmless until I started listening to what they were saying and how they were acting. And it'd be like, oh, shut up, mom. Or, oh, you know, duh, 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 duh. and I'd be like, whoa, wait a second. That kid just tell his mom to shut up. You know, like, I mean, just little things to where you cause it to slip a little bit and it segues into just mass disrespect no reverence for the elders and and uh i i think social media is is a big is a big cause for for seeing a slip in that uh, you, you brought up something great and sock i want to hear your point in, in just a second but when you think when when we think of fitness it's very easy to say if you eat bad food your body's going to look bad and it's not going to perform the way you want it to social media and just entertainment as a whole is the same way Whatever you're consuming is going to have an impact on you. It's going to do something. So you're going to consume something 
that's good for you or something that is not. You know, my son, he wanted to watch something before bed. And he's like, can I watch Animal Planet or Blue, or Blue Planet? Because he knows I'm not gonna, you, you don't, you're not going to watch something that is, you know, I don't, even, I don't even know what other shows are out there. But, you know, the toxic shit that you're talking about, you know, you're not going to have that. And then, you know, it just you lose your child to the show. The screen raises them. The screen instills values and morals and behaviors. And it, it's disgusting that. And that's why I really want to do this. That's why I love that Anthony kind of greenlit the, the Patriarchs episodes, because I want to have these conversations. There might be fathers who don't know what they don't know. They don't even realize by allowing their child, they think they're being nice. Hey, watch YouTube. You'd like to learn from this dude. You know, they don't even realize by not being the filter, you know, by not filling that role, by not giving presence, but instead giving presence with the TS instead of a CE, th then they're going to lose their kid to that individual. You're no longer fathering. You're no longer parenting. You're kind of just watching a kid be raised by another man or screen rather. Sock. Hey, can I can I interject on just one thing on that real quick? So I don't mean to interrupt you. No, 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 jump in, jump in. I, I just want to, before we move on to that, I, I want to say that I think part of the problem is that we've propped our kids up on pedestals they don't belong. And, and what we've allowed them to do is dictate the tone of the conversation, dictate the tone of the environment. Everything revolves around them. I have friends who they adjust their schedule based on what their kids need and, and certainly within within reason that makes sense, but to adjust everything for a child doesn't make sense to me. And so what I think is so valuable about fathers is that we're not just letting them experience everything without any sort of consequences or letting them decide what they want to do, but we're giving them structure and guidance and discipline and self-imposed parameters in which to operate. Some would call it discipline. We give those set that those, those imposed parameters and let them come up with parameters and then let them see the negative consequence of stepping outside of those parameters. Let them feel it. And that's one thing I try to do is I let my kids experience the full weight of their decisions, both positive and negative. If I strip them of those consequences, I rob them of the opportunity to figure out what their own parameters are and let them run rampant uh, in, you know, in a, in a situation where they could potentially hurt themselves or, or do uh, permanent damage to their their life potentially. So it's it's really important that we impose those parameters and have these guidelines in place. And you just don't see it as much anymore. It seems like that that was very well said. Do you know how many men who see this are going to be the men who said, "I never knew how to draw boundaries. That's why I was taking advantage <laughs> of my whole life. I never yep. knew." And that's exactly why that the preventable pain and sock. So I, I had written this note to talk about later, but I'd love to now. The preventable pain is where the role that fathers play. You said that, you know, how do you get to them before the trauma? Right. You know, by being an involved father. You know, Ryan Stone once said, are fathers necessary? And the, the point was, he wasn't saying fathers aren't necessary, but he's saying, look what we're doing. All of us are having men come to us that are adult men, and we're kind of filling that role and help accelerate their growth to being a man themselves. So he's like, well, what's the real role? It's the preventable trauma. It's, right. it's being able to get to them earlier. It's preventing years of pain. It's preventing men who... Don't even make it out of it. They get well, it out, you know, it's, it's, their life. You're losing 18 years of culturing, you know, and saying, hey, I can interject that at the last part of their lives. And I don't know of a job performance criteria around that you can sit down and say, I'll bone up the last five minutes, you know, prior to an exam. It's it's like trying to crush for, for an exam. You're just not going to do as well if you've been raised and been learning and developing that that knowledge base over a course of a lifetime. You know, and, and I've, I've got to confess right now, uh, you know, to sit down and say, I've done a particularly poor job with my stepsons. Um, you know, th they came into my life about a little over three years ago. We moved into a blended family uh, three years ago. And my notion at the time, uh, I had some very severe concerns about taking on another man's responsibilities and in light of skewing my own. You know, so I sat down and said, there's only so much of me going on. Uh, we're coming out of a recession or, you know, kind of kind of still very much in one, at least uh, professionally and sit down and said, there's only so much of me going on. I need the mom to still kind of cultivate her sons and basically allowed her to sit down and say, look, I'll support you, but you need to take the lead on this. Uh, and, and so basically I let the guy, the, the, the two boys kind of left them to their own devices. And that was a terrible disservice that I have to acknowledge uh, and bre you know, breach and acknowledge to them very directly. And then I have to sit down and say, I have to start with where I'm at, not where I want to be, and then turn back into it, uh, particularly with these, uh, these two young men. From the standpoint, I only have a little bit of time. 
Uh, and, and he said, I'll say, it's very odd to be in a situation where I have zero problem helping other young men out. But all of a sudden, the, the young men that are in my life, you know, that are essentially my family tribe now, I had reservations about stepping in because I was concerned about being a cuck. Uh, and you just sit down and say, how, how kind of obscene, you know, to sit down and say that I was conditioned and cultured for that. But, the, the, you know, and I don't want to blame, you know, uh, the, the influence because I, I ended up doing it, you know, and of course, like any, like any advice, you know, the advice you take, you own. Uh, and you sit down and say, I wish I didn't do that. Uh, you know, conversely, where I'm, I'm involved with my daughter, I'm spending a tremendous amount of time cultivating her. And one of the one of the most important things right now I'm doing because she's three is socialization. And part of that is surrounding her with incredibly high quality men in a social function. So uh, the night of the convention where I had everybody over at the house, she was very much out present you know, talking and engaging with everybody. Uh, likewise, when we just had the speakers over, and again, recently on my birthday, which was last weekend, uh, where I had eight or nine guys sitting at the house and she would come over and socialize and be around and see men engage with uh, these individuals. So it's not like, for example, uh, particularly with raising a daughter where you try to shoo the boys away. You wanna make sure that trouble just doesn't come in uh, off the road, you know, company does, but trouble always arrives from the range. And so what you want to make sure is that you're providing a safe, stable, consistent home quality, develop those socialization skills, all the critical life skills that she'll need, but to also sit down and say, we're going to put up boundaries and fence lines and anything coming off the range, we know is going to be relatively a threat. Anybody who's coming up off the roadway is going to be a whole different story. So you have to sit down and provide reasonable and appropriate access socialization wise uh, for a daughter, uh, but at the same time still screen uh, uh, effectively for for the uh, the barbarians coming over the fence line. Whenever you know you put on your spread, world famous, seeing your two boys, it's the like the best part of all Twenty One Con. Because, you know, the events, all the men are together, we're all doing our thing, and you get to see the future. Like, you get to see these two young men, and they're, they're, they're holding their own, they're sitting there, they're, they're, when they speak to you, they're speaking from the chest, eye contact. And I'm always, I never say it to them, but it's always like a, a mental note of like... It, it is, right. and it, you're not the only one that says that, and, and it's one of those things that I, I observe from a distance. And you sit down and say, regardless of kind of what goes on at the home when, uh, you know, where it's just us, you know, when your hair's kind of letting down and you can kind of get a little sloppy, but the boys know to present and to represent the household without a doubt. And so, you know, I think Richard Cooper brought it up is that, you know, when we sat at the table, they were making sure that certain things were done. They were making, you know, that I, I would sit down and say, hey, go get this or, you know, minor things, but they did it and there was no bitching about it. They were proud to do it. They knew they were being of service and there's a complete difference difference between giving somebody a chore to do and allowing somebody to be of service of other men uh, to be around it and essentially earn the position to be that close to that group of men. Uh, and I know uh, I've had conversations with those boys about that. They particularly appreciate it and they actually enjoy it. And so I'm trying to show them what that's like so they can replicate that in their own life because we're mammals. We learn by imprinting, by what we experience, what we see, what we observe. You know, we like to sit down and think we're rational. We can study through a book. But the reality is the real lessons are typically learned through experience and they can be positive experiences or negative. But the, the issue is you try to provide the most positive benefits and role examples or life examples you can. And you do that by living a fulfilling life in which you are thriving. And when they can see that and they can emulate it, they'll be able to try try that and know what it's like for themselves. I really like that you're talking about including your kids. I mean, that's if there's anything that we can do is include them as, in as many experiences as possible. I mean, that's mm -hmm. part of the reason why I have my son working with me in the shipping department because I want him to experience how to begin to run a business. I want him to experience uh, customer service and how we care about things. And when he messes up on, on signing it and, and misspells a name or I, I say, Hey, what we send out is, is as pro, as close to perfection as we possibly can. Can you do it better than that? Yes, I can. Good. Redo it. Right. And in a way, I love that you're talking about also earning it. Right. We, we, they, they don't get to just have stuff. They've got to earn stuff. A lot of times my oldest, cause he just wants to be me. Right. So he, he gets he gets into the conversations and he wants to be around because I include him. And at times I have to remind him, hey, you're an observer right now. You don't get to just be here and 
and you haven't earned the right to participate in the way that you want to participate. I want you to get to that point, but right now I need you to be quiet. I need you to observe. I need you to learn how I interact with other men or in, interact and engage with my business. And that's been a fine line and something I've had to work on as well for, for my own relationship <laughs> with my kids. Yep. And I, I think, you know, to add to that, one of the things that I see us doing much better, not creating complex where there's never a recognition of when right has been achieved. You know, when that you did something right, you know, we, a lot of fathers, like my dad's dad would never say like, you know, I, I'm proud of you. Or, you know, uh, I was talking to George Bruno, you know, his dad, he didn't say I love you, but he showed it by by having a roof over his head, by, by taking him on vacation. Right. You know? So I, we recently spoke about that on the morning brew and it, it kind of hit me. I was like, you know, I, I now am very intentional. I do not give it away, but when it is earned, I certainly ensure he knows that I, he can't read my mind. I have to let him know, like, hey, man, I saw what you did. I'm very proud of you for choosing to do that instead of that. You know, good job. Let's make sure we keep it up. You know, it's never a some dramatic, you know, laid out thing. You speak to him like a man because your son is a future man. Your daughter is a future woman. Speak to them accordingly. Children are capable of so much more than we give them credit. So uh, the quick pat in the back, hey, your dad is proud of you. They, they won't have that complex. I was never good enough. My dad didn't love me. No, like, come on. If you properly show love as a man, they'll never have to go through those love that are listening. oh i think are you there okay, yeah we're here okay sorry I did P peter down at the last part no i i totally agree with what you're saying um i i like that 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 socrates uh touched on something that's very good with his daughter how he's conditioning her young now i'm the same way with with my daughter she's she's eight now i'm going to be nine towards the end of the year but i've always been very selective on who i let her be around especially around men and it's only high quality men you know so she sees the difference and she knows like when somebody's acting like a man and somebody's acting like a kid and and uh, traversely, I also have a 23, well, he's going to be 23 in a couple of, in a couple of weeks, but I have a 23 year old son. And a lot of those lessons that you're talking about, uh, Hunter, like, like letting them know when they did well, letting them, um, you know, when there, when there was a mistake, telling them you love them, but like at the same time, like being the teacher, the instructor, you know, the, the all father, so to speak, um, that lasts with them because even as a 23 year old, who's, you know, doing his own thing. He's still super respectful. He's still super loving, you know, he, and you can tell that it stayed with him. No, well, I, I think, oh, I was just going to say, I think you guys are bringing up a, a great point here. And that is that we as fathers need to connect the dots, right? Like yeah. we, have, we may have learned the lesson, right? We, we learned the lesson. And I think what we fall, fall victim to a lot of the times is that we forget they may not have learned the lesson. And we assume that because they experienced something, they extracted the lesson from it. And that's not true. It's our job to help connect the dots. Hey, here's what happened. Here's what we can learn. Or better than that even is, hey, here's what happened. What did you learn from that interaction or that exchange or that circumstance that you found yourself in? But we've got to make sure that we're not leaving pieces of the puzzle unsaid or on the table by not making and formulating those connections for our kids. Yeah. When I was in the military, one of the things we'd have is you'd go on an exercise and it would be one thing you would kind of learn the immediate lesson, supposedly, or whatever happened. The most important element of the exercise wasn't the actual event of what occurred, but the after action review where we'd all sit together together and say, hey, this is what was happened. This is how things played out. What were you intending? What was supposed to be going on? What should have you done better? Or could have you done it better? Where did you fail yourself or whatever, whatever the case may be? And what we ended up doing was that we end up drawing together upon everybody's uh, experiences. And you, 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 the interesting part was owning up to your responsibility as to, hey, I was trained and I was supposed to do this or I failed to do this or I didn't know how to actuate. And you sit down and say, and you learn things by that review process afterwards, a tremendous amount more than just going through it. And so it was one of those things that I, I learned uh, professionally to do. So, so what are the things you learned when I was a Calvary scout that I apply as an architect today? is that I keep kind of a notebook off to the side, actually it's a Word document, of any of these change orders or things where you say, that was a stupid mistake, 
I don't have to repeat it again. And I, and I log it back in this other notebook. And what I end up doing is reviewing that with my production crew, my team, and we review past lessons. And the other thing what I'll do is I'll periodically pre-brief them on, hey, these are the following things we're going to do this time. We failed the last time. Here's why. This is how we're going to improve. What were some of the learned things you learned or picked up? And kind of post-interview them that way. And so I've, I've taken that in my professional life. And now I'm doing the same thing with the with the boys and doing the same thing. And and it's amazing the conversations you end up having. And it's not so much, hey, this is the experience and what I did. It's that conversation where you're engaging with them and asking their opinion and, and putting them out there and having them discuss it, that all of a sudden there's this bonding that takes place. And the degrees in which they can come to you and talk about other things that they're facing it before it ever turns into an after action review, I find to be really, really beneficial. Uh, I find it amazing the overlap between all the stories, you know, and <laughs> whether it's, you know, whether it's Ryan's son, you know, explaining, you know, what happened, you know, or just now, you know, you're saying that in, in the military, the way it worked, I'd say that that's a part of the rite of passage to becoming a leader. You know, you take your E2, you know, you take the private, you take, you know, whatever, one of the, the lower ranked guys, hey, I want you to lead this. Now they've got to stand up. It's now their turn. And for the fathers watching, there's no difference when you say that to your son. Hey, son, I want you to teach me something. And then, yeah. like, oh, now they learn. Here's how I compose myself, how I speak to somebody, how I relay my thoughts in a manner that accurately depicts what happened. You know, that's and you said something skill. really important. You actually sat down and said you have to put them in the role of leadership. I, I'm, I was a uh, military brat. My father was an Air Force officer. He didn't raise officers. My father raised great NCOs. So when the time came for my brother and I to actually go in the military, yeah, yeah, guess what happened? We, you know, one, my parents were mortified, and two, I went into the army. They were, they were just like they were, they were sick. I mean, they just couldn't understand it. And it was interestingly enough, is that it was much later, you know, where, where I kind of had a dinner party, you know, and and they were talking about it. And my dad says, I just don't understand. We didn't raise you that way. And I had to turn to him and said, Pop, you didn't raise an officer, you raised an NCO. And he goes, the hell I did, you know? And I go, when did you ever give me leadership responsibilities? You always told me, this is what I expect. This is what we're going to do. And then you told me to execute on it. That's an NCO. And so what he got was an NCO in kind. And so if we're talking about, if we want our sons to be leaders, you actually have to raise that, you know, that, that individual to be a leader. And so what fathers, I think, miss is teaching their kids, you know, essentially an officer candidate school. What are the, tr what are the, 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 the key elements of leadership? What are the examples to go by? What are the experiences that you need to do? And then put them in charge of actually doing it. Uh, and one, one of the most important ones is, is the lessons learned, you know, and Bobby talked about this, is the lessons learned through failure and finding the silver lining. And I think a lot of young men don't put themselves in a point of failure uh, and therefore they're afraid to lead. And so, you know, you, we talk about people being sheeple and everything else. I think that's a cultural response. I think that, you know, as fathers, we're not cultivating our children to do that. And I know in particular, these are some of the things I'm, I'm looking at with the boys to do and then also with my daughter. I think the reason we don't do that is because, frankly, it sucks. Like it, it sucks to watch your kids struggle. <laughs> right. Like, I don't, I don't want to watch my kids fail. Right. I don't want to watch my kids. Like my son, as I put him down to bed tonight, I don't, he was having a difficult time. He didn't want to share with me what it was. I'm sure we'll talk about it tomorrow, but I, I don't want to experience that. I don't want yeah. him to experience that. And so we make the mistake of trying to shelter them from that. And it's right. not for their sake. Guess it's who's for, sake? It's right. For, it's right. for ours. Yes. It's a yes. very selfish yep. action to not let your kids experience hardship and heartache and failure and leadership that you're not saving them. You're tr you're attempting to save yourself and you're, mm -hmm. you're doing them a great disservice when you do that. Yeah. And, and ultimately you're kicking the can down the road. It's going to be pay me now or pay me later. You you'll reap the benefits of the neglect and, and the, the lack of involvement at, at a critical time. It, it you will see it come back. And it's going to oh. be worse. It's going to yeah. calm down. I was yeah. going to say, with, yeah, exactly. Yeah, with interest. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Accrued interest. And now shift gears a little bit. Do you guys, are there any subjects you won't discuss with your kids? And the reason I bring this up is growing up, my father would not talk to me about uh, finance. Like, he would not, we did not talk about money, like how much he made, how he spent it. I, I, didn't, I had no idea how to manage it. The Navy taught me that, you know, or religion, politics, you know, the taboo subjects, sex, relationships. 
you know, I kind of learned all of that on my own. Do you find yourselves because of the men that you're around, you, you understand the need for that to, to be discussed and kind of be open? Or is that still something that per parent, you know, some people will talk about it, some people won't? One of the advantages my daughter uh, has, we homeschool her too, and it's like she's an only child, uh, essentially, because all, her, her sister and brothers are, are in their 20s and out of the house and living somewhere else. Um, it, it's, it's kind of a blessing and a curse because she hears the way that my wife and I, who are two adults, interact with each other. And we tend to interact with her the same way because we don't want to dummy anything down for her. So it's made her real smart. But it's also made her real hip to where like she has questions, you know, so so she'll she'll see or read or do different things and then she'll want to ask. And I find that there's there's a tactful way to approach everything, but I don't think that you should necessarily hold anything off when it comes to them asking. I would I I. I Personally, I try and take the most tactful person. I mean, I, I suppose we can sit here and think of extremes that I'd just be like, no, we're not talking about that. But in general, okay, um, I, I try to be in, as informative as possible. And, and what I've been seeing with that is she was in gifted and talented classes this year. She's going to be in gifted and talented classes next year because with this inquisitiveness comes just a, a brain that's continuing to flourish. And, and I'm for that. I, I mean, for me, I, you know, I, I try to look at it and think as objectively as possible, you know, as, as the person in the interaction talking about pornography, for example, with my eight-year-old son is not a comfortable conversation. That's subjective, right? It's uncomfortable for me, but objectively, it's probably a pretty good idea to start addressing. He's on the internet. He's looking at things. He's probably curious to some degree. And so I, I need to look at it objectively and think what is in his best interest, not mine. So as awkward as these conversations are, it's in his best interest to learn. And, and I think too, you know, to, to the point earlier is like, we, there's, there's times where it's appropriate and times where it's not, you know, if you're having the birds and bees talks, you're, you're not going to tell your seven year old son, all the intricacies of how this happens, but you can, you can talk about some of it. Right. And I think a lot of the times we think of these things like it's a one-time conversation, right? Oh, have you had the birds and the bees talk? Well, it's not a talk. It's a series of conversations. So it's not like a one and done type thing. It's like, well, tell me what you know. And then he tells you what you know, and you expand on that a little bit. And maybe a couple of months later or a year later, as it becomes more appropriate, you expand and you expand and you expand. But this is not a one and done thing. This is an ongoing dialogue with money, sex, pornography, drug and alcohol use, anything, any, there is nothing off the table here at our house. It's just a matter of the way we approach it and what's appropriate based on their age and maturity level as well. You know, the only reason, and excuse me real quick, Sock, the, the only reason um, why, and you touched on something with, with pornography, and I shouldn't say the only reason, but it's a, it's a main reason why we do stay very open like this. I'm going to tell you guys a story. There was uh, this this service that was available, this app, it was called TikTok, and it was bought out by someone. But essentially what it was is these kids could post these videos of themselves lip singing to popular music. And the videos were very short. You know, they were a certain time and they do funny things like dance or whatever. And it was a bunch of kids. She showed it to me. I thought it was harmless. Right. And I'm still on it. Like, OK, show me what you're posting before you post whatever. About two weeks of her after or two weeks after her getting that app, she comes to me one day and goes, dad, uh, I got some not good stuff. I got to show you this, you know? And, and I was like, Hmm, look at somebody had sent her a dick pic. She was like seven years old at the time, dude. So like when you're talking about uncomfortable conversations and you know, whichever, yeah. And social media creates them, uh, especially if we're not careful and we let it go too far in this age of information, they have everything at their fingertips and things that you think they haven't seen yet. They very well, very well may have already, you know? So it's, it's, we don't want to close off to that, which was like the typical stuff because then you're going to, they're going to be bouncing their heads off of a bunch of different things like pinballs growing up, trying to learn. Well, and who do you want them to learn from you as a mature right. man or little Timmy down the street, whose parents aren't around, whose dad's whose dad abuses his wife. Like he's going to learn or she's going to learn who, who would you rather 
your child learn from? Me. Me. So I have to do it as uncomfortable and awkward as it may be at times. I think that goes very well, especially when dealing with daughters. You know, she was open enough to go to you. Hey, dad, like something's up. You know, that the same thing. You know, I talk a lot about you never want to be the dad saying, I'm going to sit here cleaning my shotgun when you get home to her date. Look, she's going to hide dates if you do that. If you don't know how to handle your daughter eventually becoming to the age of dating and you're just insecure with yourself and you've got to put on, you know, the, the fake tough guy, like, you know, you're not going to shoot the teen. He knows it. You know it. So you're just putting on this persona that it's not really who you are. But if you develop a relationship with your daughter to where she's open about these things and she'll talk to you about, you know, when that when that happens and, you know, she's into boys, whatever. And she'll say, hey, you know, this is this is the guy I'd like him to meet you. She'll want you to vet him instead of trying to hide him at school. Bingo. Bingo. Yep, absolutely. Yep. So, yeah, and, and, and Hunter, to kind of jump on, 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 on your question, I don't think there's any topic that, you know, in my household that we don't talk about. Uh, you know, obviously, it's going to be age appropriate. But one of the things I think we focus on, on is have have sustained conversations about a variety of issues so that when you need to communicate or if there is a need there, they know naturally to be able to come to you and, and, and respond to you. Um, recently, it's going to sound super stupid. On social media, there was a uh, short little video of some little girl on a, a cooking competition show, and she couldn't open up the jar that she was uh, going, trying to utilize. And she kind of, kind of, you could see it. She's frustrated with it. And then she looks over to the sidelines and she sees her dad runs over there, gives him the jar. He opens it, gives it back to her and she's back into the race. You want to be that figure. And a lot of things were, were taking place there. One, you knew that wasn't the first time she came to him with any number of things. And the reason why she knew she could go there because he had been consistently been there throughout the course of her life. And so I think you want to be able to have that. Um, you know, not, and not to just plug the, the, you know, the book in my red hat, but the whole concept of kind of these storybooks is to be able to start engaging your children uh, early on in conversations with things, you know, and so you can bring up and discuss fictional characters and the challenges they're facing, you know, like in a particular case of my red hat, it's, it's bullying. You know, how do you talk to your children about bullying? How do you prepare them in advance? And what are what are the skills? And trying to talk to your kids, say, hey, have you been bullied today? Or did you see this? It's going to be a really hard conversation to have when they don't trust or have that established. But to be able to sit down and have a story well in advance of it ever occurring, being able to talk about fictionalized characters or, you know, how to respond or how to see these things and have that kind of discussion well in advance, I think serves everybody well. And that's, again, going back to, uh, to develop in a culture and that culture of discussing things openly, reasonably, responsibly, even when they're serious or, or frivolous or, you know, what we would consider taboo, I think it's going to be terribly important, you know, whether it's porn or women or sex or money, food, uh, you know, any number of things, there's a whole litany of subject matter that we're going to have to, to face. And the key is you can't prepare for all of them, but you can, uh, you know, confirm and, and establish the lines of communications before you need them so that when they are there or, you know, when your challenge is that you don't have to establish that line of communication during the heated moment in a crisis. Hey, Sock, one of the things that, that actually reminded me as you were talking is <clears throat> one of the things my wife and I have consciously decided is not, not, to, not to make our kids feel stupid about some of this stuff. For example, mm -hmm. you know, it might be easy with my oldest son. He's 11 now. He's starting to get into girls and he's noticing girls and he's got little crushes and things like that for me to tease him about that right? For me to bust his balls about that. But the problem right. is if I do that, that's going to shut it off. He's not going to want to come talk to dad anymore because right. dad teases him. So my wife and I have made a conscious decision that we don't make our kids feel stupid when they ask questions and we don't tease them about sensitive issues. We're, we're open, we're receptive to those issues and we talk maturely about those things. Right. And, and the, the other is that, you know, for example, if in you know, particularly with how a young man's going to relate to a girl, you know, how to flirt, how to engage, how to approach. And the interesting thing is if you're not doing that with your partner, or your wife, and they can't see that, they're not going to emulate the same behaviors. And so there, there was kind of a, a, a stupid thing I used to do with my girlfriend, uh, my partner now, uh, when I go out is that you, if you ever had a still of a moment when you don't know what to say and you're out, you, you act like what would her cat do? And, and her cat would like test her, you know? And so there would be a glass of water sitting on, on a table and I would just sort of move it towards the edge, not, not say anything about it and just move it and then, and keep moving it to the end. And at certain realizing she's realizing really quickly that you're, you're going to push this over. And then the question is, is are you the type of guy that actually knocked the glass over or not? 
And, and it got to be a kind of a fun thing. And, and you have to be the guy that's going to knock the glass over and then go, see, now this is why we don't have anything nice, you know, and, and make a big, big deal out of it. So having done that with her, uh, her and I, I, I was flirting one time at dinner and all I did was tap and move her glass a little bit. And she got a big ass smile, grin, and the boys wanted to know the story, you know, what happened here. So it's now kind of cultural shorthand in our house that if you're going to tease or something, out, you just you just go over and you kind of move a glass or you don't even have to have a glass. You just kind of do the 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 hand pattern of, of like you were. And, it, and, and so what happens is I watched this young man actually do that at a social event with one of the girls he was engaging with is that he's young, he's sitting there and, and he just goes over and starts moving the glass. And she's like, what are you doing? And she grabs a glass, like he's going to knock it over. And he just got a big ass grin and laugh. And you look at it and go, the kid just cribbed off my stuff, but you sit down and say, he imprinted and learned how to do that. And so I make sure that they see me being romantic with her, that I'm sensitive and intimate with her, not necessarily in a sexual way, hold her hand, caress her, do those sort of things that they understand how mammals interact naturally with each other, particularly when they're attracted to each other and not necessarily be associated with arousal and sex. Uh, and so that they, they have these sort of skill set firsthand, having directly seen and witnessed and experienced that. You, you touched on something interesting, uh, Socrates, uh, when, you, when you had said uh, the reason why the girl that had gone to her father, that she, you can imagine the, the backstory to it, that she had gone many times because she knew she could depend mm -hmm. on him, right? right? That is such a vital part to have in your family, not only with your kids, but with your spouse, so that they, is that they know they can depend on you. And it's not just for money. It's not just right. for a place to live. But it, it's for it's for safety. It's for guidance. Uh, it, it's it's for 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 teaching and love, you know. Uh, so so I think that that's that's an important aspect when we're thinking about things to pass on, um, because we were given we were given this this uh, example from from the old ways, so to speak. And and but we've also seen with. I guess I guess you call it some of the boomer generation, but even later than that, to where these old people that withheld certain info or maybe weren't as easy to talk about certain info, then you had their kids that, you know, and that whole generation just kind of drifted away from what was the standard for so many years, right? So there, there's there's the the fact of being there for them and and being able to share is so important and being able to be dependable on so many different levels just because of that, so that they are getting the full picture and they are going to be, have the best skill sets possible and be the best served possible out there in the real scary, dangerous world. Right. Uh, rather than maybe uh, missing pieces of the puzzle. Right. Right. I think when we look at this, you know, that's the importance of doing what it is we're doing in this show. You know, having this conversation, putting these things out there that some people just don't, again, they don't know. So, but they hear it, they watch the show, they're like, oh man, like I'm the guy teasing my kid for being into girls. You know, when really like that, it should be the reverse. You know, you treat them like a, a young man who's becoming a man, you know, a future man, if you will. You know, that's, you wouldn't tease me if I was talking about, you know, uh, and talking about my wife or flirting with my wife. You'd be like, all right, cool. Like that's what you do. You know, so why is it different for your boy? It shouldn't be. So that, that's part of it. And the other part to what Sock was saying, is children follow our example, not our advice. I've probably said that a million times, and I'm going to continue to say it because it's so freaking true. <laughs> what you do, you can't tell your son, hey, I read the Rational Mail, and you should make sure you're a gamer and Kino and do this stuff, and then they look at you with your wife, and you guys are walking on eggshells because you hate each other. You haven't had a laugh together in months. You know, you barely sit down and can look each other in the eye during meals. You know, that, they're going to see that. They're going to replicate that relationship. It doesn't matter what you say. It's what you do. You know, they're watching what you do. They're going to follow what you do. So make sure you're living the message you're spreading. You know, we talk about LARPing. You know, don't be the LARPing father. And that's why whenever we do these shows, I, I try to focus so much on applicable advice. What we're telling you is not for you to sit and nod your head for the next hour and then to go back to doing what you're doing. You know, take what we've taught or take what we've discussed and make sure, you know, audit yourself. Are you doing the things that we're, we're sharing? Because these, these, are, these are working. You know, these aren't coming from positions where we're, saying to do this, but we're not doing it ourselves. All of us are living the life and it's, it's working. We're all in good positions, which is why we're here talking about it. <clears throat> so make sure that you're in your life doing the same. And something I wanted to share with you guys is one of the most detrimental phrases a father can say is 
He'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. No, man, they, they may not figure it out. Don't just assume they're going to learn this life skill. That is your job. Do not give your duties away to anybody else. Oh, they'll figure it out. I don't remember who brought this up. It, it might have been a totally different show. But somebody was saying that a young man, let's say he's 21, he was going to marry a mom, twice divorced, had four kids, and she all she wanted was like his money or something. And he's like, I, and she didn't want to sign a prenup or something like that. And they went to the dad. They're like, hey, you know, have you talked to him? And the dad was like, no, he'll figure it out. This kid is about to go into a very hot mess, and the dad could not care less. Now would have ruined the kid's life or at least set him back a decade. You know, so that's our duty. That's why we're fathers, to, to, to bear that burden. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. Everybody wants to be the king, but nobody wants to do king's shit, making hard decisions what kings do. This is actually one of the problems I see not only in raising, raising kids, but even within what we're trying to create individually – uh, with our own movements, for lack of a better term, is one one phrase I hear quite often is, real men don't need to be told how to be men from other men. <laughs> and I'm like, that, that, that's the exact opposite of what is actually true. Like, real men learn and model from other real men. And if you're thinking that you can't learn from another man, you've got an arrogance issue. Your ego is getting in your way of letting you step into fully what you're capable of stepping into. When we look at it with the relationship with our kids, it's easy to say that. Yeah, little Timmy's going to model me. But it doesn't change as we get older. I learn from you guys. Like if I'm not sitting here learning from you guys, my peers, that's a problem. And that's hindering my growth as a man. I completely agree. We had a discussion on that in the fraternity. And it was on the quote, you know, follow example, not advice. You know, when you see men doing the thing, so I see what you're doing. I'm like, oh, I'm going to follow that example. You know, I don't care really what you're saying. I like to see what you're doing. Same thing for Bobby and Sock. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, all right, that's really working for you. Like, I'm digging that. So the next time I have a party, Sock, I'm going to make a spread like yours, man. I'm going <laughs> to go for it. I'm going to take a video for it and everything. <laughs> As I saw, like, I was like, man, like, you're doing it much better than I am. I want to do better. So I'm going to raise my standard when it comes to hosting people at my home. I'm going to treat it. You're not like a like an amateur. I'm gonna actually put some thought and effort into it instead of like, hey, here's some steak. <laughs> yeah, well, and the interesting thing is that you know we talk about a spread, and, and the party was a huge spread. But uh, for my birthday, it was not that necessarily elaborate. You know, we had these fairly large planks of wood, and we put some, uh, you know, ro- you know, um, essentially cold cuts. You know, a little bit of cheese. We put some fruit. We put some nuts. Uh, essentially, trail mix. And we put the we had two of these on either side. And the idea was that in the middle of the table, you could pick and choose and kind of you know, as everybody's sitting, you had to, there was this communal property about, you just didn't get a plate and put everything on your plate and kind of eat it. You're all doing, you know, essentially a Swedish Norwegian smorgasbord of food. But the, the idea of communal living, breaking bread with each other, having the discussions, doing those things was, it was absolutely intentional. And so I recognize the value of uh, the, what the, 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 the value of food has as far as a conveying system of values and sentimentality of having people to your home and sharing food as well as you share ideas and company and spirit. And so that's always been deeply ingrained in me. And that was something culture, uh, you know, something my mom uh, did, you know, my folks were, you know, from very small towns in Montana. Uh, and then my dad becomes an air force officer and has to then be, you know, quote an officer and gentleman. And I, I saw, my mother really take that to heart and so that was impressed upon me my father enabled it to a high degree and so when we're in Europe we get to see other things and we've incorporated a lot of that and it becomes a point of pride and so that you know I know that for example I can tell the boys hey I need this set up and they know to go do it you know as opposed to you know saying hey let, let's go sort of you know take care of this and I have to dictate what that is uh, but there's that element of saying hey Food is kind of central to this experience, and that becomes a referential point for grounding the experience and something that I, I take pride in and something I make sure that I do when I host everybody at the house. And that, that is something very, very important to me. And it's, and it's displayed on, on, on the platter itself. You know, without, without knowing you and, and, and what you're necessarily talking about here outside of what you just shared, uh, I, I imagine that your boys are behaving like that way, that, that, way, that standard because not not because you told them what to do, but because you told them the why behind it, right? And, and, and then involved them in the process of actually doing. So there was actually where you set this tray up, kind of do it. And the interesting, the, the really kind of fascinating point of this is 
because of the scale of it at the party, uh, you know, with the 21 convention, we were essentially hosting, this is going to sound obscene, we invited everybody at the convention to the house. And so you're talking over 200 people were in my house at one time and we provide hors d'oeuvres, drinks, liquor, the whole nine yards. So part of it was I sat down and said, hey, I'm going to need some support staff, you know, send over some of the volunteers from 21 convention. And a couple of guys that I knew and they're still around, having them, they wanted to see how this was done. And one of the guys who had volunteered before, who was my roommate, knew kind of how to do this. And it wasn't necessarily totally confident in getting it done. So you give them the, the instruction, show them kind of how to do it, have them elaborate, have them improvise, and then kind of do it and then replicate it. And so the boys are watching me mentor a much older young man, you know, the guy in his mid, mid to late twenties on how to do and prepare stuff. And they're seeing me do this with them as well. And then interesting enough, a couple of weeks later, he's back at the house and we're talking and he talks about how he ended up doing the same thing. And he goes, he goes I totally stole it. I'm, you didn't steal it. This was a gift, you know? Uh, and he absolutely took pride in it. And to the point that he, you know, sent and, you know, showed me the photos of this thing and he did a killer damn job. And, and you could sit down and, and acknowledge that he had not only done that, but he set a new level and mark for himself by being exposed to the event, volunteering and doing everything else. And the boys actually got to see this whole process take place and how that enriched him. And that was also part of that learning process. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been a really interesting uh, dynamic of kind of, kind of doing that, hosting everybody. Uh, initially there's a lot of trepidation, but you, you sit down and say, this is something I believe in. I'm going to open it up. Uh, all the flaws, the benefits. This isn't about just having uh, an immaculate event. God knows uh, the houses. There's things that needed to be worked and everything else. It's not about shielding my image. It's about presenting, hey, this this is this is life down and dirty. And, you know, but at the same time, we're acknowledging the importance of this event, this benchmark. And, and essentially, we're celebrating, you know, by hosting these guys over. Uh, and it was a, a great way to bond and exchange value in kind. Now, I, I did open up the the chat to questions, so I'll start throwing those you guys away. But before I do that, I want to touch on this will be kind of the final open point, and then we'll let the guys, you know, kind of steer where it is we go. So first, I want to give a shout out to where is it? Tower Guy seventy seventy seven. He said, "I need to go, but I wanted to say this: you need to train your children for the world they will grow up in." not the one that we did. I thought that was very insightful. You gotta prepare them for the reality they're gonna be facing, not the one that we went through. Things change, we as fathers need to evolve. Now the final point, the way you do one thing is the way you do all things. When you were talking about the spread, you know, the when, uh, Ryan, when, earlier when you were talking about writing the name and making sure you know how you do this is gonna be as close to perfection as possible, that, that transcends just that thing, you know, my son the other day was hanging out with his friend and he, he's walking by and he said, did you do this? And he said, yeah. And I was like, whoa, no, <laughs> you don't, I'm not your buddy. You don't say, yeah, you say yes. You know, and he immediately fixed it. It's one of those things where as long as you're consistent in everything you do, we say, yes, we give each other respect, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, whether you're all in on the thing that you're doing. So with your spread, you do it with everything you have. It's the best damn spread it could be. You know, then you go to your schoolwork, you do the best schoolwork you can do. If you're going to take on a project like building something, you're going to build it to the very best. It doesn't have to be, you know, Socrates level architecture. It just has to be your very best. You put, there's nothing left in the gas tank. You put it all in the field, you know, and I think that that's a, a lesson that a lot of people are going, a lot of fathers, let me be very specific. I'm talking to you, the fathers who are, are, are possibly slipping and thinking good enough is good enough. If you think, ah, I raked most of the leaves, the ones in the edges, I don't got to worry about them. Or I mowed the lawn, but I didn't, I didn't edge it. You know, that's good enough. Your children are going to live life that exact same way because how you did that is how you're going to do everything else in your life. It's good enough, you know, and I, I don't think that's that's a proper mindset we should be instilling in our children these days. Well, I mean, not yes, absolutely. But success is found in that extra 10%, right? It's easy to do the 80. It's easy to do the 90. That's what everybody does. But if you really want to excel, then you've got to do the things that most people won't. And most people won't rake under the bushes. They'll rake around. They'll rake the grass, but they're not getting under the bushes. They're not getting on their hands and knees and pulling that stuff out of there. But you do that stuff, you're going to set yourself apart. You know, Hunter, you're, you're talking about it's not the thing. It's the spirit of the thing, right? It's not, the, uh, it's not what you say. It's, it's your MO. It's your modus operandi, like, like who you are. And that right there, when we're talking about 
what can we give to our children as, as fathers earlier talking about consistency, uh, kind of blending it all in together. That's the way that you're going to serve them the best, uh, give them the best skill sets for the world that they're going to go out into, right? Is, is when you're showing them a thing that you do stay consistent and you do stay with the spirit of who you are, right? Because inconsistencies will, will cause, you know, those fluctuations. Uh, we have this, this big thing nowadays, and I'm not going to write it off to act like I'm, I'm a psychiatrist or I'm, I'm medically trained. I'm not. So anybody that's listening, don't take my words right now for medical advice. <laughs> the the but, disclaimer, yeah, I like it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but, but what I see a lot or what we see a lot nowadays is the kids with the ADD or the ADHD, right? And, and these different diagnoses. And, and I wonder how much of that is just kids that don't have consistency in their lives. Kids that are able to be the pinball in the machine rather than to be directed down a lane. You, do you understand what I'm saying? So I, I feel that, that with consistency and staying to the spirit of, of who you wanna be and, and what you would like to instill in your kids is, is one of the best gifts you can give them. They'll remember it forever. You think about you know being plugged in front of the screen you know, it's seven years old and like Rand was saying, you know, the kids dictate the terms of the relationship in the in the house, you know, their, their brains are all over the place. And if you foster that and you don't instill those boundaries, then of course your kid's going to be bouncing off the wall in the classroom. Nobody ever taught them to sit down and, and to pay attention. Nobody ever forced them to have some discipline and self-restraint. So now all of a sudden they're medicating and now he's jacked up for, you know, however long that he's got to pop pills and now it's messing up his wiring. Or just to entertain himself, right? We live in this world where you can be entertained just instantaneously. And how often, like, I remember when I was little on Saturday mornings, we'd get up, we'd get up before my, my mom would get up and we'd watch some cartoons. We'd have some breakfast. Then she'd get up. She'd say, all right, get on chores. So we'd get changed. We'd get our chores done. And then she'd say, okay, go outside. And we'd go outside and right as the door closed, she would lock the screen door. And then I, for the first half an hour of being outside, I'd say, mom, I got to pee. And she'd say, that's what nature's for. Mom, I got to do this inside. You can do it later tonight. And for a half an hour, I resist, resist, resist. Every Saturday, I'd resist until I realized, okay, well, she's not giving in. I'll go find something to do. And me and my buddies would, would climb up on rooftops and throw GI Joes off the rooftop with napkins as parachutes. And we'd, we'd find ways to get in trouble and we'd fight and we'd do things that boys do. And then my mom would have to scream throughout the neighborhood and call all the moms in the neighborhood to figure out where we were at. This is, this is what I think a lot of kids are missing is that go use your creativity, go use your muscles, find a way to entertain yourself, not behind a screen, not behind the game, not behind an iPad. And, and there's, there's value to those things. I'm not saying that, but if we're medicating or escaping reality or helping our kids escape reality through those devices, it's a problem. And then we got to hop them up because they never learn to make the connection between boredom and being creative problem and solution and and we have the kind of environment that we do now i have a motto in the house that is if the sun is out you are out and mm. it's now to the point where <laughs> hey, can i watch tv you know or can i play a game is the sun out yeah and they get up and go <laughs> like i don't have to say it anymore they just know like is the sun out all right you're out <laughs> awesome. it used to be when the street lights came back on that was when oh, you, dude, home. you ride your bike like get home, home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm going to grab the first question. This one is for you, Ryan. From Jeff Putnam of Rugged Legacy. What would you say has been the most difficult decision you've had with your kids and how did you approach it? Man, I've been through a lot. Um, I mean, just, just right off the bat, it's, it's, it's our move. We moved across the country three weeks ago. And we, we always felt like it was a good decision. We felt like it was a prudent decision. We're in the position to do it and felt like we could take some, some calculated risk. Um, but the greatest factor was how my kids would adjust. You know, I'm pulling them away from their friends. I'm pulling away from the things that they know, the things they're comfortable with. Uh, there, there was a lot, of, a lot of fear and uncertainty and doubt in their mind as they were leaving friends and, and they were considering not knowing anybody out here and not getting along with people. So that was a real challenge. Um, but it was an open line of communication as well. You know, what, what, what are you worried about? What are you excited about? What opportunities will present themselves? Hey, if, if, 
if you need to make new friends, how could we do that? And we would jump online and we would research this area. As soon as my oldest son found out what kind of animals were in the area and how many animals were on our property, he was all about it. So we really opened up those lines of communication and I didn't judge, you know, if the kids were afraid. I didn't say, oh, you don't, no, you don't need to worry about anything. Well, that's bullshit. There's things you need to worry about. And if you're worried about it, that's valid. So let's, let's work through that. You're, you're worried about not having any friends. I get that valid concern. That's actually something of mine as well. So what can we do to ensure that that's not the case? And so they've been very involved in, in activities and um, they're, they're, they've been at a, a church camp this week. And next week, my, my other son's got a photography camp. We got him involved in jujitsu. These are all things that we talked about leading up to this. And, th and it's taken a lot of the sting off. I won't say it's not there. It is, you know, my daughter the other night was crying because she missed one of her friends. And so the sting is still there, but these open lines of communication have really been valuable. And we have these conversations around the dinner table too. You know, what, what, what was the best part of your day? What was the hardest part of your day? What'd you learn? What are you going to do tomorrow? These types of, of conversations really uh, take some of the edge off in, in difficult, uh, difficult circumstances when they have to leave the things they know. As a fellow, now fellow New Englander, I think you made a great choice. <laughs> uh, so far, you know, I've only been here three weeks and it's beautiful now. I, I don't know if I'll be singing the same tune in the middle of winter, but uh, we feel pretty good about it so, so far. Excellent. <laughs> and now you brought up talking at dinner. And one of the things I do is, is I was talking to Dan Tanner Guzzi and he shared, you know, at 21, the way he does the questions, you know, and before bed, you know, what they do, where the Guzzi's all like the, their whole mantra. And it's incredible. I think every family needs to ensure that you're, you're having that moment in the day. You know, what did you do today? What did you learn? What was the best part of the day? What was the worst? You know, and those questions, you're going to learn so much about your kid. You'll find out what they're learning in school. You'll find out uh, what's going on with their relationships with friends. You'll find out, you know, if they're scared about something, if something's bothering them. There's, there's so many opportunities that you can better know your child and have a better relationship with your child if you have that moment, though. If you're not eating dinner together and everybody's sitting plugged in front of the TV, or, you know, two people are eating, somebody's on their phone and somebody else is, you know, trying to touch, shove their face and work, you know, like you're never turning the outside world in and you have a family, your family matters. You need to get rid of the world and have family time. That's just for them. I think every man here would agree that I, if, if something was going on with my family or their family, we would not be doing this right now. That comes first. That always comes first. But if you're not putting your family, I mean, ahead of checking Facebook and scrolling, if, how many likes you got in a new profile photo. Your priorities are out of whack and your children, are, you're never going to know them and they're going to grow up and you're going to look back and be like, man, they grew up so fast. Now they're gone. I wish I had more time. Why? You have time now and you're not using it. So really, really evaluate your priorities there. The other thing I'd say on that too is if you're doing that, there's always an expectation of contribution in our household. Like if you're going to be part of this household, you're going to contribute. And it's as simple as when we have these conversations at dinner, it's easy for our kids at times when they're tired to say, oh, I don't know. I didn't have a very good day. Wrong answer. That's not a contribution to the discussion. So if you need to think about it, we'll go around the, the table and we'll get to everybody else and we'll come back to you. But there's an expectation of contribution in, in our home. And uh, the more we uphold that, uh, that, that expectation, the less likely we have to address it. <laughs> so my daughter has become notorious for going, oh, I don't know. Yep. <laughs> she, she always wants to go last. She, oh, she does. Closing her mind. up, everybody. Yeah. So my son, like, it was, it was like three days into it, like three days, and she keeps going, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And he's like, What? How do you not know what you did today? Just say something. Just make something up. He's like, You always get to go last. And like, he's knife handing her. And I'm like, This is the best conversation to see. It was amazing. It's <laughs> awesome. You know, there was something, uh, I, I think the original question from, from Jeff was, was something about what the hardest decision was with the with concerning our, our children and uh, that we've had to make concerning our children. And when, when you were talking about your move, Ryan, m my hardest decision I ever had to make also concerned a move, but mine was to escape just a, a really, really crazy ex who was my son's mom. That was just like in this stalker saw me having a new successful life with, with a new beautiful wife and just could not handle it. And, and I mean, it was like when, so when I was on parole working and had my place and doing whatever, it was stuff like threatening to call the cops and saying I had guns, you know, just different, different things like that. Now with my son being in her custody and me, you know, and not just, not just her, but other mitigating factors where I said, you know what, I think I'm going to do a move. I think I'm going to go to Northern California. Um, 
it was a really, really tough choice to have to detach myself from my boy because a woman was like going to cause some actual uh, danger or damage to my family. I mean, if I leave, what happens now? My now my new wife is is a single mom with with a new kid. You know, I mean, so it, we have there's these choices. And that was extremely difficult because I didn't want to have to do that. You know, and, and we're put in these in these uh, situations. Uh, do I talk to my boy? Do I love my boy? And does he love me? Of course, you know, we talk and we but there was still this thing that happened that had to happen, but it was uncomfortable for everyone. And that was that was the roughest choice I ever had to do concerning one of my kids. All right, the next question is from Bully the Line, and I'm pretty pumped about this one. He recently found out that he's going to be a father in 2020. Any good books out there for first-time dads? Before anybody answers, congratulations, man. That is awesome. Yeah, definitely, definitely congratulations. Yeah, congrats. All right, so gentlemen. Are there any books that you go to or have gone to that you found help you become a better father? If you had to pick one, I mean, the, the, answer, <laughs> the answer is there is no book that will prepare you for. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say the same thing. It's you're, you're going to be reading stuff, and it's not going to be meaningful until you're in it. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I I don't know if there's anything fatherhood specific, but there's so many great books out there on on how to improve yourself. And you know what, you're gonna you're gonna be tempted. And, and, and it's the right temptation, but you're going to be tempted to pour all of your heart and your energy and your resources into your son or daughter and into your, your wife. That, that's a great temptation. I'm not saying that's wrong, but you're going to get a lot of advice too from people on how to raise him or her and what you should be doing. And, and the, the, the counter to that advice or the thing that you won't hear, I don't think a whole lot when it comes to being a new father is don't ever neglect yourself. Don't ever neglect yourself. Like if you give everything to your child and everything to your wife and you, and you do that at the expense of yourself, it's going to create real problems. It did in my life. My, my wife and I went through a separation when my son was one years old. And, and a lot of it was because I was throwing myself into what I thought were, were noble causes and noble ambitions. And they were, it was my work. It was her, it was him. But I did that at the expense of myself and I really let myself go. So as far as specific books, I mean, th there's so many books, but what I'm, what the point I'm making is that find things that will edify you, that will uplift you, that will allow you to continue to work on yourself um, and, and take the advice as it comes, but don't ever forget to make yourself a priority. I'll piggyback off that one because I had the same response as you guys. I, I was just not going to say it because I don't want to influence anybody else's opinion. <laughs> so there are no books. There's a lot of awesome blog posts. A third of my blog is dedicated to fatherhood. It's not just a plug. It's just to say a lot of people have said a lot of cool things about a certain part of fatherhood, but the, the greatest strength is speaking with other like-minded driven fathers. Something like this panel, if, we, if I were to sit down and ask them for, for advice on something I was facing as a father that I couldn't find the answer to on my own or wanted some counsel, that would serve me 1,000 times more than sitting and trying to find it in a book. And, and I, I'm, I'm stuck to the author's narration. I'm, I'm within his. But when you speak to somebody else's mind, you can flesh it out. You get the full picture of the thing that you're working on or that you're trying to chew through. So, I mean, you're a new dad coming up. You know plenty of personalities, uh, accounts, sites, uh, individuals that are family-focused. Jump on those. Start engaging with those men. Start, start forming a relationship with them. And when the time comes to where the child is arriving, then it's go time. You know, it's actual game time. You get to apply all the things you've already learned. You're pretty much prepared for I mean, you're not going to be entirely prepared for, obviously, you know, once a baby's there, it's kind of like, oh, oh man, like it's real. Like, here we go. Let's do this. The sleepless nights, you know, helping the wife make sure she's motivated and you know healthy and able to recover. You know, there's a lot that goes into it. But the best thing you can do is start forging that network now. So when you're gassed and you're like, man, I, like, I, I'm out of it. Like, I just need to sit and chill and do something besides talk baby. You, you've got those guys to fall on. Hey, man, you know, how's this going? Have you worked out? Are you eating right? Make sure you get your rest. And like Ryan just said, are you taking care of yourself? You know, it's, it's great to, it's what men do. We sacrifice, you know, we take care of the ones we love, but you can't self-sacrifice your way to happiness. You know, if you put everybody forward, you're just going to run out of value as a man and they're all going to leave you behind because you gave all of them all your value and you're worth nothing to them. You, you don't do anything. So 
you know, start forging those bonds, man, and find men again that are that'll keep you accountable, not ones that'll tell you it's all right that you're slacking off. Yeah, I'll I'll jump in here too. Um, during the patriarch convent, there was a small portion of my speech where I gave and I talked about uh, I advocated about fathers taking responsibility for safeguarding and protecting their children, and in this particular sense, it dealt with not an external threat but an internal one in which your child soiled themselves. And I'm amazed at the number of men who will sit down and say, "I don't do that. Uh, I won't change my child's diaper." Uh, and my my stance was you need to engage that vigorously. Uh, and so one of the things that I did when I was trying to, you know, a very new father was I learned how not only how to change a diaper, but why was that important? And the, the issue is, is that I'm caring for my child. And so I developed the technical skills and I won't get into the technical detailing of it, but one of the things I did is I developed a go bag and essentially it was very much like a medical kit. And it was based off kind of the, the medical kits that we'd see in the military where I had a bag already pre-set up for the that particular mission and objective that I knew where everything was at. I could go through the motions. I had every tool and resource that I would need in that bag, but it wasn't just the bag and it wasn't changing the diaper. That was the task. Again, it was the why. And what mattered was, is that I had a distressed child who had soiled themselves that was looking for help and assistance that could not communicate that in any other way than crying. And so the first thing you do is you don't treat the symptom, you treat the, the casualty, the individual. So part of that was to pick them up, hold them, touch them, constantly be in contact, look them in the eye and tell them, hey, we've got this. We're going to be OK. Uh, Daddy's here. I'm going to take care of you. And you start doing that. I'm doing that with an infant. And it was interesting over the year and a half in which I would consistently sort of do this is that I became the world's best diaper changer. Uh, I could do it with one, almost with one hand. I can talk and engage, you know, touch and hold my child, engage with the, 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 the child, and you're engaging the individual, not the actual diaper. And it didn't matter how bad the thing was. I was always prepared to make sure we could work it through. And if it was a real hot mess, you could tell her, woo, you got a real, you know, you really did a, a number on this one. And, and, and the, the issue was it, it became something where I also knew that I wasn't just the only parent doing that. Um, it typically was my, my spouse would actually end up doing most of the change in the diaper. But when she was exhausted, when she was really spent, I knew I could jump in right then, read the body language, take care of the baby, do everything else. And then essentially what I would do is because mom's spent, make sure mom's being sit down, relax, you know take care of her. I've got this. She knew I did. And then immediately take the child. I'd prop her up on my shoulders. And then her and I together, the child would go and do one or two things, low hanging fruit that weren't being done right then, you know, uh, pick small things up, engage, do the dishes, whatever the hell it was, because what's happening is you have a partner that's completely overwhelmed. And so in essence, I'm taking care of my complete team when I'm doing this, not just changing a diaper, not just caring for my child, my baby, but also my partner and making sure that they know that they have that resources that, you know, for full impact and be able to do that. And, and it became kind of a, a touchstone to have that bag to the point that, uh, you know, Mary Frances would not use her own bag, regardless of how I set it up. She would actually go to mine because it had, you know, quote, special properties that the baby was more calm when she saw that bag mom carrying them her own uh, and it became linked and the the proudest moment of my life was when my child came to me having soiled you know this is when she's walking now and she would kind of signal that that she soiled herself and she was choosing dad when mom was right next to us and i sat down and you just sit and go oh you know and, and and i know it killed my partner you know because baby's choosing dad in that case where normally it's mom during the caring and nurturing but it was well, my role is to provide and protect with my child and to cultivate that relationship so that when she knows like the little girl with the the jar she knows where to go when she needs help. And it's not just that I'm competing with mom, it's obviously mom and dad, but I wanted to make sure that my daughter knew that. And that was the first sure, sure ass sign that I was getting that right. And it, it will be a moment in my life I will never forget. <laughs> you gotta hang on to those men. <laughs> yeah, I really do. <laughs> like, there's a sign I'm doing it right. None of us yeah. have a pamphlet that what we're doing is the right thing, but there are, there are signs along the way, little check yeah. like, all right, yeah. maybe something's sticking. All right, next question. And I'm going to I'm going to jump on this one quick because this is near and dear to my heart. Opinion, what is your opinion? This is from Diesel. On pushing children for excellence per age group, specifically young kids. 
when is it domineering and when you're being a good dad. So when I look at, when I read that, I read that as coaching, you know, you, you might mean it with schooling, you might mean it with home life and other things, but I, I viewed that and I'm going to take the coaching angle on it. You see a lot of coaches who are stomping the feet, yelling at kids, being demeaning. Now, a little humble brag, we just won our championship. So back-to-back -back titles, what's up? Now, those boys though, they, they play the most disciplined baseball and we are the most disciplined team because I treat them with respect. When it comes to pushing the kids too hard, when you start living vicariously, when you start getting mad at the kid for not winning the game so you could get the props, none of this is about you. When, you, when you're raising that kid and you want them to do better, you, you push them to the point where you see that, that they're, they're hitting that point of like actual stress. They're hitting the point where they're, they're starting to fracture a little. And then you pull. Parenting is a push and pull game. Sometimes you do ride a kid too hard. Hey, you should have done this. You know, why not? And they're like, you're not realizing they're just kids. They just couldn't. Or, you know, you relax too much and you're realizing, you know, you, you keep getting B's in school. You know, why? Like, well, you never force them to get A's. You never push them to go harder. You never studied with them. So the balance between a dominant father or a dominant coach and a domineering father or a domineering coach is the intention in which you're pushing them. Are you pushing them for you to feel glory? Or are you pushing them because you know there's more in their tank that they can give you? You know, Hunter, you bring up a good point that there is a balance. And I think any man would be a liar if they said, oh, I've called it right every interaction I've ever had with my kid. No, there's been plenty of times where we've been like, man, I wish I would have done that better. I wish I would have said that better. I wish I could have maybe presented that in a better way, right? And, and, and it's, it's a learning game for us as well, just as much as it is for them, right? But there is this fulcrum point. I, for me, I think the fulcrum point, it, like you're saying that, that fracture, it, it's like the, the trauma condition, right? So I'll, I'll, give, you a, I'll give you an example. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that, that my, my grandparents, especially in particular, my, my dad's dad, uh, were very hands-on, kind of told you once old school type people. Uh, he owned an aviation business and there were these special brushes that we had to use to clean the planes with because they, the, the, the actual windows aren't, aren't glass. They're a type of, of, of uh, plexiglass and it'll scratch it if you use regular. So you have to use all this special cleaning equipment. He said, don't let those bristles touch the ground, right? And sure enough, about half an hour into it, I got careless, man, and that thing fell over and touched the ground, right? He came over, saw it, and I said, oh, gee, Grandpa, I'm sorry. Bow! And he hit me with that broom right upside my shoulder, but it was enough to knock me down on my 14-year-old self down on the ground, bring a tear to my eye, said, don't let the bristles touch the ground again. Now, I never let those bristles touch the ground again. But the point being is there was a there was a this this uh, this moment of trauma, okay, you know, to where now I'm I'm like getting beat with a broom, right? To where we could have done that better, right? So I think that when like you're talking vicariously in the fracture, when we're bringing it to the point to where we're going to traumatize like like traumatize children or, or or bring something that that you wouldn't you got to you got to stop. You got you to gotta assess to where things are going to be done the right way because you don't want to do something just like you want them to remember the good of you all their lives. You don't want them to remember just bad thoughts about you all their lives either. Bob, you bring up a, you bring up a really good point. I think we get so wrapped up in what is the immediate result, you know, I, with what you're saying and then Hunter with what you were saying with regards to coaching. I coach too and sometimes we look at it and think that the ultimate result is, is, is the proof, right? We, if we win the game, then we did it right. The problem with that is that the game is not really the game. The at bat is not the game. The, the, the game is not the season, right? So you may have won the game. He may have got you not to drop the, the, the broom on the ground, but ultimately he lost a little bit of potentially respect, uh, some credibility, some authority. He undermined himself. And I'm not pointing it at him without pointing it at me too. I've done that as well. It's like, I don't, I don't care about the game. Like, how can we win the season? I don't care about the season. How can we win the, the tournament? I don't care about the tournament. How can I raise my kids to be self-sufficient adults? I don't care about that. How can I raise them so that they can go raise their own kids? We look at it at these little like micro moments and think that if I can produce the right result now, then I win. And we fail a lot of the times, I know I do, to look at it in the grand perspective of things and think about how I engage with this child after one uh, strikeout or after one 
little misstep where a kid drops a broom on the ground, which is really not that big of a deal, right? But we got to look at it in a broader perspective when we're considering the results and the ramifications of the way we're treating our kids. And they say what we do echoes in eternity. They're, they're going to carry this. The way we raise our kids is the way they raise theirs, you know? So let's make sure we, we do the best we can and set them up with a solid foundation. And from there, they can build even higher and even higher. And you know, your great grandkids are doing better than your kids and they're doing way better than you. You know, there's nothing well, better than that. And, I would and also say it's okay to, to, to say you're sorry. <laughs> like, like, I think that's one thing we have a tendency of not doing is we recognize when we mess up. Like how many of us, even just us here and the guys on the call who have had, you know, a few sleepless nights because they screwed something up and yet they just blow it and brush it off. It's like, just go apologize. Show some humility to one of your children and say, you know what? And I've had this conversation with my oldest boy. I said, you know, what you, the way that you performed yesterday wasn't up to par. Uh, but the way I performed also wasn't up to par. And here's where I failed you. And here's where I messed up. And here's what I'm committing to doing differently next time. Like it's, we're human, we mess up. But if you don't admit that and don't show your children how to handle situations when you screw up, man, we're missing a powerful, powerful moment to teach them how to respond to their own screw ups and, and mess ups in life. Ryan, I've had those same moments with my daughter to where I said, look, you messed up here and this wasn't right. But you know what? The way that I said this or, the, you know, by me, that wasn't right either. And I just want you to know that it, same kind of conversations. And you got to be able, like you said, to, to just not only it's not just for the immediate thing of saying sorry and doing right by your kid. It's for the grand scheme of things, the larger picture, like you were talking about, to show them how to be. To like once again, like we were talking earlier, the spirit of the thing, to like give them that spirit, you know, show them what it is. Now, I'm going to put the, the final question out there and we'll wrap this thing up. What are some meaningful family traditions that you pass down to your family or new traditions that you started doing with your family? I like, the, I like that they included new traditions because there are some things I do that my family didn't do growing up, but I'm like, we should totally do this. So uh, one, that one first. Yeah, one thing that, that we do that, uh, that I really like is every morning we get up, uh, we read scriptures together. And, and I think a lot of families do that. I don't think that's, that's specifically unique or anything. But one thing we do after scripture study and after our family prayer is we do a family meeting. Dude, and that family meeting. I was just going to say that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so powerful. And, and that meeting, I'm not saying an hour long meeting. I'm saying five to 10 minutes all right, hon, what do you got going on today? Here's what I've got going on. I've got jujitsu and then I've got this call at, at uh, eight o'clock tonight that I've got to be on. Kids, you, you've got this camp or this class and we just use five or 10 minutes so everybody knows all the little workings and intricacies and where people will be throughout the day and it just lets us get on the same page so there's no confusion about what's going on and then it's a ready break and we get to our thing. So that's, that's one little uh, ritual that has actually been very, very, productive and helpful in our life. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that one right off the bat. Uh, I, I do it on a regular basis with me and my partner. And I literally call it a business meeting, you know, so that they know that this isn't just something in shorthand. What's taking place is family business. And this is we're treating it like business. And it demands the attention and respect and execution on elements of that conversation, whatever come out of it. And it's not just me dictating. It's a it's a give and take back and forth. What's going on? What are the plans? What are the objectives? What can I see process and be done and hold everybody else accountable to include myself? And so that every, there's no misunderstanding. The expectations are clear and concise and everybody's aware of it. You know, a few years ago, well, no, it's only 2017. In 2017, I, I bought a new travel trailer uh, and, and, you know, it's just my wife and my daughter. And, uh, and we started taking vacations in, in this in this trailer started bringing it places and the cool thing about RVing and doing that is is it, it's there's a whole process once you get somewhere you got to pack it up you got to unhook then you got to hook other stuff up right and there's all these little opportunities so I said like for example when I when I'd either disconnect or connect the ball my daughter would be the one calling it this was prior to me getting the tundra and now there's just a video camera there that just shows me right but but you know i'd have her do these little things to where it was like okay dad you're good oh stop you know and and it, and it creates this involvement you know with my wife going and and dumping the the tanks or with it to where it's like we're working as a team 
and, and as a unit. And, and those kind of feelings uh, to me are, are when you get this real cool sense of pride to where you're like, oh yeah, they get it. Like we're, we're working together as one. This is awesome. When it comes to family traditions and new traditions, you know, every, every holiday, every season, we've got a thing we do. You know, whether it's a movie we watch, so it's like Muppets Christmas Carol for Christmas. You know, for New Year's, I let the kids stay up. You know, it's one of the things I let them see the ball drop. And like, I know they're my kids are nine and six. They probably shouldn't be up at midnight, but it's, hey, I, I never know if I'm going to make it to the next year. I want to bring this one in with my kids. You know, but we, we break the rules sometimes. Sometimes breaking the rules is the tradition. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll do that thing. Um, sitting down and having a meal together every day. That is that is almost a non-negotiable. Very rarely are we going to go, unless like something's going on, maybe we have company and we're all going to go out and do something. But for the most part, every single day we are sitting down and having a discussion over our meal together. And, and there's no phones. There's none of that. That's not even considered. You know, and I've got a lot going on, you know, and I, I put my phone away. So there's no excuse for anybody to have their phone. Now, when it comes to interactions, we do family meetings too, even though Ryan stole my juice. So the family meeting, get everybody together, you know, get them all on the same page, you know, and then if something's going on, maybe something happens and you want to call a family meeting. Hey guys, e-break, something changed. We, we got to pivot, shift gears because that happened. Let's dial it in. <clears throat> and one of the new things or a new thing we do is every night before bed, you know, I still, I still say goodnight to them. We, we will sit, we'll have some reading time. They'll all read together. You know, and it's it's whatever, you know, if they want to read about horses or they want to read about, you know, uh, my son's reading City of Embers or something like that. You know, I'm sitting there reading some Jocko. <laughs> it is what it is. You know, you just grab your thing and just you spend time together without doing anything together. You're all in your own little world, but you're together. And having the family together is one of the strongest bonds you can have because the family will always look back in their life as being with their family. You did things together and that's what they'll do with one another. When they have their family, they'll they'll bring them together. And most importantly, as they grow and they get older and uh, another father who's going through 31 DTM right now kind of shared this with me, they'll want to hang out with you when they leave the house. They'll come back home. They'll want to spend time with you. They're not going to forget about you and kick you to the curb. I've got my own life to live. See you later, dad. Like, no, they'll want to, hey, dad, check, you know, stopping in, come to see you. You know, when you're older and the kids are out of the house, you know, there are some people who look forward to that. I, I don't at all. Like every day I'm like, man, my kid's getting they don't need me as much. And like the day they leave, man, I'm going to be like, oh, this sucks. <laughs> like when they go to bed, I'm like, man, I kind of don't want them to go to bed, you know? Like I'd like to sit and talk to them some more. You know, I like my kids. So it, you build it to the point where you enjoy your family. And that in itself is one of the strongest traditions that people should bring into their lives is actually having a good time together. All right. That's funny that, that you say that about like, like not wanting to let them go because I get up really early in the morning. So I, I'll get up anywhere from three uh, to be usually between like three and, and four thirty, and, and I'll see my daughter sleeping. And it's the same thing to where I'm almost like, hmm, I should just get her up right now and we can do breakfast together or something. I'm like, nah, man, it's four thirty <laughs> in the morning. She doesn't need to be up yet, but it's that same time of feeling. It's like, Hey, my little buddy, let's get her up, you know? And, and, and that's totally relatable uh, as a, as especially a good father. So I, I get where you're coming from with that. All right. It is nine thirty-five. No more questions <laughs> in. So we're going to wrap this one up. Sock. Where can everyone find you if they want to learn some more or talk fatherhood with you? Yeah, you know, to be honest, I'm probably most prevalent anymore on Twitter. Uh, you can find my blog at manyandupsmart.com. Uh, it's kind of a little bit of defunct because it's been so much emphasis put on the video productions associated with 21 Convention and the uh, 21 Studios. Uh, so that there's a tremendous amount of content there. Uh, but, you know, typically uh, you'll start to see me more on uh, social media. And then I also have a YouTube account uh, where I'm just now starting to produce some video content uh, that, that's going out. Very limited. Uh, just getting that. That game and again that's going to be at Manny uh, YouTube at Manny and up smart awesome Bobby people want to talk fatherhood new dads where can they find yeah you? so so same thing uh, we have we have the, the Twitter uh, feed which is kind of my prominent social media area even though I am on Instagram and both of those are at real Bobby Dino there's also bobbydino.com where you can read the different blog articles that I have up uh, where we we also have the, the nonprofit that's that's starting up, although the website is still under construction, that'll be coming. But if you want to uh, reach us, 
I'm one of those people that where my DMs are always open. Uh, you can, you're always free to drop a, a line or a question and uh, reach out, uh, use this social media platform, what it's meant for to, to, to connect to others. Awesome. Ryan, thank you for joining us. Yeah, no, this has been great. Yeah, as far as connecting with me, um, Twitter and Instagram is where I'm most active, both at Ryan Mickler. My last name is M-I-C-H-L-E-R. And the podcast, that's probably the best place is the podcast. Just search for Order of Man wherever you listen to podcasts. You'll find our, I don't know, 450 or probably nearly 500 episodes now. So check it out. That's awesome. All right, I'm Hunter Drew. And to close this one out, I want to remind you of something. You know, talking fatherhood is not as glamorous or exciting as talking about money. It's not as glamorous or exciting as talking about sex. When you look at the numbers, you know, the patriarchs is never gonna get the, the same views as the, the other channels talking about that. But I promise you, the Red Man Group patriarchs is carrying the biggest fucking club of the internet because we're the ones that are leading to intergenerational change. We're the ones that are leading to, to life changing moments being shared between parents and their children that's gonna lead to a future that's gonna be better because of what it is we're discussing here. So when you look at the channel, when you look at what it is we're doing, if this is something you support, look at the links below. Support the channel, support the men that are constantly on here, dedicating time to you away from their families to help raise the standard of all families. Thank you for tuning in.